So hi everyone, it's my pleasure to warmly welcome you to the third lecture uh, of the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Elvis Imafido, I'm one of the um, lecturers in the World Philosophies Program here at SOAS. Um, the, the World um, the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series is uh, designed um, to create a space for conversation about philosophy as a human experience and to explore the rich heritage of uh, the various philosophical traditions from the West, the East, from Africa, from the Islamic world, uh, and so on. And um, it resonates with our understanding of philosophy here at SOAS as a human experience and not a Western experience or an Eastern experience, but a human experience that, have, um, uh, that, has, have, uh, that has this very rich tradition, which is often uh, not always fully explored in uh, the history of philosophy as we have it. So the idea is to um, uh, rethink the exclusion and the uh, I mean the colonization of philosophical um, knowledge that we have in human history and provide a space for decolonizing it and uh, allowing for diversity and inclusion in the study of philosophy. And we are therefore very pleased to have uh, an iconic figure in this uh, regard with us today. Um, before he is introduced, I would also like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Sean Hawthorne, who is the subject head for the World Philosophies Program. If you could just say hi. And um, we also have with us here, uh, Dr. Andrew Hines, who is also a key member of the World Philosophies Program here. and was, um, was very, very instrumental in getting this, uh, this particular lecture organized. So I would like to invite um, Dr. Heinz to introduce our guest speaker. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, Elvis. And can I just quickly ask as a bit of housekeeping for everyone to make sure your microphones are muted um, so that we don't cross talk over each other unless you're talking, of course. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. And um, today we have the honor of being joined by Professor Hamid Debashi. Um, I'm going to give kind of a generic biography and then two sentences or, or three maybe about why I think he's particularly interesting for this lecture series. Um, so um, Professor Debashi is um, the Hago Karavokian, do I have that right? Um, uh, professor of Iranian Studies in Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Um, he's taught and delivered lectures in many North American, European, Arab, and Iranian universities, and um, he's very famously written uh, 22 books and edited several different volumes with many chapters, um, and he's also a very prominent writer um, in Al Jazeera and other news outlets. Um, so he's somebody who stretches um, multiple disciplines, and I think that kind of is one of the first reasons why I thought he would be a very interesting person to contribute to this lecture series, because one of the things we bumped up against as lecturers in thinking about the question of how to teach philosophy um, from a world perspective is the realization that we have to maybe step outside of um, the disciplinary approach to philosophy as it's typically taught. Um, in a European model university. So bringing in other, dis um, other disciplines. And I think that's something that um, Professor Debashi has certainly done in his own career in his writing. But I also think there's something theoretical that's very interesting about him in this space. And so, um, and I'm gonna actually bring up, he is uh, a, a professor of comparative literature at Columbia. Um, and in, I myself did a PhD in comparative literature. And one of the debates was between what's called Weltliteratur. So the idea of world literature, um, and then a post-structuralist reading of literature. And I wanna really quickly talk about why I think, um, I'm so sorry, somebody's beeping at my door. Um, so you have to excuse me, it's the perils of working from home. Um, I think I'm gonna close this door briefly so it doesn't interrupt us too much, I'm so sorry. Definitely need to get a different doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's one of those, um, let's all take this is a good moment for us to take a deep breath and laugh I think um, <laughs> anyway um, 
so there's on on the one hand we might think about the world through this lens of what's called Weltliteratur, the term comes from Goethe. And it's this idea that some text, whether they be literature, philosophical, belong to the world and not just one nation. And it's a great idea. And in some moments, it's a very interesting idea. But at the same time, one of the things we bump up against with this idea is that somebody sets the parameters of what ends up being a great work of literature, a great work of philosophy, et cetera. And so we realize that it has a limit. On the other hand, um, we, we, might, we might go along with somebody like um, Foucault, who says the future of philosophy has to be in the world. And in Foucault's vein, he's critiquing the heritage of his own tradition. But then at the end of the day, both still speak from the perspective of European philosophers trying to wrestle with the question of the world. Where is the voice of the other person fundamentally? And that's something I find very fascinating and, and poignant about what Professor Debashi's work might bring um, to us today. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you and just say thank you so much again for uh, being with us today. My pleasure, can you hear me? Great. Uh, first and foremost, uh, please allow me to start by thanking Dr. Andrew Hines uh, for his kind invitation to give this talk today. I can only hope to deliver only an inkling of the fun that he and I had uh, discussing the topic of my talk over a couple of uh, exchanges, which resulted in the speculative title I offered him to draw attention of his colleagues and so on. Uh, let me also thank Dr. Elvis Imafidun uh, for his equally kind attention to details of this talk and sending me the handsome poster that you have uh, prepared to stage this talk on the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent almighty Zoom, on which I have been teaching, it looks like forever. Uh, I only wish, by the way, I knew of his wonderful book, The African Philosophy and the Otherness of Albinism, uh, when I was uh, writing my book on the Shahnameh, in which I have a discussion of albinism in the figure of the legendary hero, Zal, who was born with white hair and his royal father ordered him abandoned to wilderness. It's quite an extraordinary story. Uh, I equally regretted not knowing of Andrew Heinz's metaphor in European philosophy after Nietzsche when writing my other recent book on Europe and its shadows, where I begin with Nietzsche's famous suggestion that truth is a mobile army of metaphor, etc. Uh, but I, I place that, as I habitually do, uh, next to Fanon's proposal that Europe is literally a creation of the third world. Uh, he meant it more, of course, metaphorically, but I meant it more uh, literally. Uh, this, in short, is to say that after a couple of email exchanges, I felt already at home in the company of my colleagues at SOAS. I, as I told Andrew, I terribly miss London, uh, especially SOAS. I wrote my doctoral dissertation in, back in the, in the 80s, early 80s in SOAS. Uh, I don't know if any one of you remembers that uh, shape of SOAS before its uh, renovation. Now it looks very fancy. So uh, it is not just the product of this year's uh, confinement in, uh, because of the COVID. I just miss uh, London. Uh, I also want to uh, share that in one of his late last emails to me, Andrew wrote, and I quote, also just to let you know, we will be having a workshop on Ibn Sina and Ernst Bloch earlier on that day of your lecture, and are likely to have several of the presenters in the audience of your talk, etc." This reminded me of a famous uh, anecdote we have, that this guy from Johnston, Pennsylvania, dies and goes to paradise. St. Peter's come forward, this is a Christian paradise, comes forward and says, you know, we have a, we have a custom here that anybody who comes from the other world, we can have to share the story. Uh, so the man from Pennsylvania, uh, Johnston says, yeah, I, uh, I can share a story. I, uh, we had a famous, uh, uh, flood, flood of Johnston back in 1898. I can tell the story of flood. 
So St. Peter said, well, that's a wonderful story. But keep in mind, Noah is in the audience. So uh, <laughs> I have no idea what's the connection between Avicenna and Ernst Bloch, but I am absolutely convinced that there would be uh, some, uh, th there has been some wonderful talks. I wish I could hear them. Now, as to the title, as for the, uh, the way that the title suggests itself, you can tell that for quite some time now, the focus of my thinking has shifted from what to where. I'm no longer concerned with, it is beyond my capacity, what is world literature or world philosophy or world religion, but where is world literature, philosophy, etc. Uh, what is, and as you know, the, the adjective, adjectival world appears in multiple places. What is world cinema? Uh, what is world religion? Uh, to me, the question is, where is such a world performed? World philosophy or world religion or world uh, literature or world cinema? Where is it performed, staged or interrogated? I've always found something irritating and quite frankly arrogant about asking the question, what is world literature or music or philosophy or cinema? Uh, especially when the word ethnos comes, for example, in our own department music here in New York, Colombia, we have ethnomusicology. I always say if, if Mozart sneezed is, and I'm absolutely convinced Mozart to sneeze beautifully, melodiously. That's music. But the most sophisticated Indian or Arabic or Persian or uh, African uh, music is ethnomusicology. I wonder what is this ethnos doing there? The reason that this what is troubling is that the person who asks this question is placing himself, occasionally herself, in the metaphysical assuredness to tell us what these things are. You know, the same way that, as Andrew just said, uh, Goethe said, you know, let's pay attention to world literature. This is his world. Whereas the question of where has a sense of wonder and being lost. It is like asking for an address or direction in a city you don't know well. I always love the, the initial sense of being lost in a city. I do not quite know well. And the minute we know it, it loses its mystique and mystery. Uh, as I was sharing with my colleague, I've been looking and thinking about the title of your own department. And I'm reading from uh, a BA in world philosophies in plural that you're uh, offering and program may also be studied as a single subject degree. Uh, I, I got it off your, uh, website. Philosophy has been a significant activity in most cultures for several thousands of years, which is true. It seems to be a natural development of human societies to ask complex questions about the fundamental nature of reality, etc. A degree in philosophy from SOAS with its focus on the philosophical tradition of Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe offers you the opportunity to become conversant, M moves on. Now, the aspiration of this project is of course entirely admirable, but at the same time, it generates certain number of questions. What does exactly the adjective of world does to fit? Myself, no. I, I was, can hear you now, yes. Yeah, I was suddenly muted. Uh, the adjectival world does to philosophies or how universal is or could this claim on philosophy be? These are two, but not entirely unrelated questions. Let's say Islamic philosophy or Vedic philosophy or philosophies of Taoism. What happens to them when we place the, world, the word world in front of them? To be sure, Islamic and Vedic philosophies, as well as Taoism, have had a world of their own. It was not a world, it was the world. In other words, 
any philosophy is ipso facto and right off the bat, as we say, is a world philosophy. In fact, to itself, the world philosophy. The issue is how does a word world implicate or accepts Greek philosophy? Is Greek philosophy also a world philosophy? The same way that Islamic philosophy or African philosophy is a world philosophy? Or is it the world philosophy? And what happens to this Greek philosophy when it goes east to inform Islamic or Jewish philosophy long before it comes to Europe to become European philosophy? There is also the issue of things that Muslims or Africans or Chinese or Japanese do if it is also philosophy or is it something else? Muslims have used the word hikmah, but they have also used the word falsafe, falsafa. But is falsafa philosophy or is it something perhaps slightly different? I recently provoked a, a distinguished uh, Palestinian uh, philosopher friend that I said, uh, uh, falsafa is not philosophy. Falsafa is falsafa. It has a, has a different etymolo etymology. It has a different genealogy. As Heidegger says in that famous exchange with his uh, Japanese interlocutor, he hears aesthetic and he hears Greek. Well, you might say, let him hear Greek. So what? Why is it, we must ask him, he hears Greek and he hears German? Why is it? that he hears Greek and he does not hear Arabic or Hebrew or Persian. Languages and philosophical traditions hosting Plato or Aristotle or Xenophon long before German, French, English, or any other so-called European languages hosted Plato. And even today, in what sense are these languages quote unquote European? What happens when Mudimbe, writes African philosophy in English and thinks in French, or Enrique Dussel thinks his liberation philosophy in Spanish with a Latin American inflection, or Abdul Fattah Klitu thinks his literary philosophy is in Arabic, but writes in French, or thinks in French, but writes in Arabic, or the most prominent, arguably European philosopher is an Algerian Jew who can only write in French about the monolingualism of the other, as he puts it himself. So when we come to the problem of religions in plural and philosophies in plural, in the school of history, singular, religions and philosophies, is it a singular or is it plural? Why is history in singular and why religions and philosophies in plural? This pluralism has been kindly extending to religions and philosophies, but not to history. I'm just playing with the words. I'm sure there is a history for this. But it still retains its Hegelian capital H. And in the singular Geist that cannot travel except towards the Brandenburg Gate, where Hegel saw history on a horseback when Napoleon was marching in Berlin. So in short, we are in a condition when philosophically we are biting more than we can chew. Otherwise, we are at the moment when Levinas said, as you know, quoting Levinas, I often, I often say, though it is dangerous thing to say publicly, that humanity consists of the Bible and the Greeks. All the rest can be translated. All the rest, all the exotic is dance, end of quote. Now, I, for one, have no issue with the distinguished French, French philosopher considering only Bible and Greek to amount to humanity. I see nothing dangerous about the proposition, uttered privately or publicly. The issue is why would a French philosopher, even a Jewish French philosopher, think the Greek and the Bible are his and not mine too? If I went to Plato and said, Mr. Plato, I am Persian, he would know who I am, even though he may not like me. 
But if Levinas went to Plato or Xenophon and said he is French, neither of them would not have a clue who he is. The issue is this bizarre, contorted, and utterly flawed sense of entitlement to the Greek or to the Bible, disregarding the Greek preoccupation with the Persians or the Babylonian Talmud in its ambient Sasanid context. That brings me to the uh, famous passage in uh, that video that I said of when uh, Derrida is asked, bringing the question of gender, when Derrida is asked which philosopher would be, uh, would be, uh, could be his mother. And I want to share, if I could, Andrew, uh, hold on one sec. If you had a choice, what philosopher would you like to? No, let me first share my uh, screen. Where is my screen? I think, okay. Elvis, you might need to make Professor Debashi a co host. Yeah. Oh, a, are you? yeah, hold on a minute. Uh, I'll make you, I think. It's working. Yeah, it's working. So you can see my screen, right? You may have seen this. I will just do a couple of minutes of it. That's his, his style. That's his, his own style. Okay, let's see what everything is. Uh, you can all see it, right? Like Andy? Andrew, you can see the screen? Good. If you had a choice, what philosopher would you like to have been your mother? That's his, his style. That's his, his own style. <clears throat> I have no really already answered this question. Let me give me some time. My mother. <laughs> a good question. It's a good question. Exactly. I absolutely adore this moment of pause. This, this is the master, the constructionist, mind you. Okay. And he is outmaneuvered. Beautiful. Uh, it's an interesting question because I try to tell you why it, 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 it's impossible for me to 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 have any philosopher as a mother. That's the problem. Hmm? My mother, my mother couldn't be a philosopher. A philosophe ne pourrait pas être ma mère. Et... Again, a moment of absolute revelation. He resorts to his mother tongue in order to say that his, his mother, no philosopher could be his mother. Très important. Ça veut dire beaucoup de choses. Ça veut dire que, euh, que la figure du philosophe pour moi, et c'est pourquoi aussi je, suis, je déconstruis la philosophie, la figure du philosophe est une figure masculine. Okay, he, he goes on. Let me stop sharing. You can watch it. The, my, the point that... Uh, are we all okay? Yes, just please remind everyone to please keep yourselves muted. Yeah. Uh, the, the point of, the, uh, of showing... I hope you will, uh, you will watch it on your own. It's, it's quite a wonderful. And it's one of the products of teaching on Zoom because... Uh, there is a limit to how much I can share text with my students. I roam the, the internet in search of these magnificent uh, uh, videos of wonderful philosophers. Uh, so when you listen to, to this wonderful uh, interview, he does concede that his daughter, he said no philosopher could be my mother. This is the whole point of phallologocentric, critique of phallologocentricism moves on. But then he says, yes, uh, my daughter could be my uh, uh, a, a philosopher. Uh, then, as I was talking to Andrew, I said, how, thought to myself, we could flip the question even higher and let it come down head or tail, asking Derrida or any other European philosopher, thus located, what Muslim or Chinese or Indian or African or Latin American philosopher could be his father, mother, sister, brother, even distant cousin, or did I say perhaps illegitimate son or daughter? Born and being raised out of the wedlock. In that spirit, I wonder where 
this is this is the point of my raising the question of where, not what is world philosophy and how is she doing? Because now the whole question of gender and homoeroticism, uh, you know, I need not tell you all the way back to the Greek and of course, Persian and uh, Jewish and uh, African and Latin American context uh, uh, comes, uh, comes to the fore. That raises the question of whether or not what, for example, people do in Africa or in uh, Islamic context or Jewish context, is that philosophy? And for that, I want to share again a couple of minutes of another video of a conversation between the Portuguese philosopher, Buaventura de Sousa Santos, and uh, uh, Mudimbe, Waiwi Mudimbe. Again, I'm going to share my screen and uh, go here. Probably we need to... That's a different thing. Um, Professor Debashi, we can hear you. Can't see you. Pardon me? We can hear this the video but can't see it. So okay. if it's visually important, let us know. Otherwise we can hear it. That's okay. But I wonder why, because I'm sharing my screen. If I share my screen. And is my sharing my screen? You should be able to see this. Can you see my screen? We just see black at the moment, actually. Uh oh. So. Okay. Uh, so, just trust me. It's a conversation between uh, the Santos and Modimbe. But I hope you can hear it, right? Professor Dabashi, could you stop sharing and then share again and start again? It, it couldn't okay. work now. I just tried something. Okay, I stopped sharing. And yeah, then I'll start sharing, sharing again. again. Can you see it now? Can you see the screen? No. We can hear it, so perhaps we should proceed. Okay, yeah, this, this sound is fine. This conversation of the world with uh, Valentine Mudimbe and uh, the Susa was held in 20th of June 2013. And we see a garden, wonderful garden, in which this conversation is. There were different conceptions in the Western tradition. But if you now try with this more humble, in fact, more humble idea that there are different ways of expressing, so I would have no problem in conceiving of sagacity or orucus. Philosophy as philosophy. Uh, I say, well, philosophy yes. is Greek. No, why? Uh, philosophy is big. So Santos's position is he has no problem as a European philosopher to think of uh, African philosophy as philosophy. And this is Modimba's response. In terms of uh, tradition, in terms of mm -hmm. conceptualities, and uh, in terms of uh, ways of transmitting it that one think and in different cultures non-western cultures we have also systems of knowledge mm -hmm. if we decide to call them yeah the weltachkangen mm -hmm. in africa or latin mm -hmm. america yes they are organized and the open systematic uh, systems of knowledge. You see, this is my point of dancing around the concept, systematic, organized way of thinking, knowledge, instead of philosophy. And then she, he jumps to philosophy. And uh, we can, and uh, we can translate them uh, into French or uh, into English and uh, teach those uh, mm -hmm. systems of knowledge within a class of philosophy because we are submitted to the tradition mm -hmm. that uh, tells us what is astronomy by the method of mm -hmm. uh, doing astronomy the same for physics and uh, the same for philosophy nothing absolutely nothing uh, prevents us from uh, accepting uh, the idea we use every day there is a philosophy of MDs in, mm. uh, let's say, the United States, which is uh, different from the German. Uh, there is uh, uh, a philosophy of, uh, let's say, 
uh, younger people uh, living uh, in the desert uh, of uh, Africa in Sahara. Uh, there is a highly remarkable series of books which uh, uh, are called uh, classic African, mm -hmm. African classics. Right. Yes, it is presented systematically with uh, notations uh, very demanding, uh, with uh, uh, a translation in it. And uh, if... At any rate, I'm going to... Uh, I hope it, it, the conversation is called Conversation of the World, uh, Valentine Madimbe and Buaventura de Sousa Santos. It's available online, and I can uh, later send the link if you, if you wanted to uh, watch. Let me stop sharing, so we're back. Uh, there is another video I wanted to share, but because you can't see it, I won't. Is a conversation with uh, with uh, with Hannah Arendt uh, uh, that in which initially, when the conversation begins, she is complimented that she was the first woman to be interviewed in a philosophy forum. To which she responds by uh, paradoxically philosophizing about how she was a political theorist and not a philosopher, okay? That is, in other words, the, what she speaks is what today you can, you can teach in a course in philosophy, but she insists she's not a philosopher. I mean, she has the shadow of, uh, of uh, Heidegger, uh, both professional and personal uh, on, on her mind. Now, uh, my uh, issue of question of uh, uh, location, uh, whether or not something that happens that is done by a, a philosophical political theorist like Hannah Arendt, or by Modimbe, or by uh, Enrique Dussel, is it philosophy or is it uh, something else? Especially in the case of somebody like, like Enrique Dussel, who is in deep and close and intimate conversation with Levinas, is goes back to that infamous passage in Kant, observation of the feeling of the beautiful and the sublime, uh, in which again I draw your attention to the name of your own. Uh, uh, institution, School of Oriental and African Studies, because for, for uh, Kant, Africa is part of the Orient. In fact, conception of Kant's Orient is anywhere east of the Danube River around the globe to the west of the English Channel. That's the, the entirety of that is, uh, is Orient. This is his conception of Orient, and they're incapable of philosophy. Uh, the fame, infamous passage of the Negro, uh, you remember in the uh, 1764 text, pre-critical text of uh, Immanuel Kant, observation on the feeling of the beautiful and sublime, the Negroes of Africa have by nature no feelings that arises above the trifling, as the Hume challenges, you know the, the passage, so I will not uh, repeat it, uh, that this person may have said something intelligent, but uh, it was obviously stupid because the man was black. Now, all, uh, usually, uh, uh, philosophers, African philosophers, other philosophers who come to this passage are obviously agitated by its uh, racism and begin to criticize its racism. Whereas I think the issue is not its racism. The issue is, uh, is something else. This is a pre-critical text that in his more mature, more elaborate critical text, critique of uh, pure reason, critique of uh, practical reason, uh, and then the third. Uh, in the first critique, critique of pure reason, we have the constitution of the knowing subject. And that knowing subject for Immanuel Kant, predicated on this passage in pre-critical text, is a European knowing subject. And the content of the second critique, critique of a practical reason is the constitution of a knowable world. So you have a knowing subject and a, uh, standing in front of a, know, a knowable world. And people in Asia, Africa, Latin America are part of the knowable world, could not be a knowing subject without dismantling the system. There is a video of, of James Baldwin 
in a talk that he in fact gave in London. Uh, after Raoul Peck's film, I'm Not Your Negro, that, that video is no longer available online, in which James Baldwin says, at some point in the, in the context of a conversation, if as much as I stood up and walked from here to there, as if I had a right to be here, I'm almost quoting him verbatim, the entire structure of Western civilization would collapse. I mean, think of the, in, and he is very careful with his words and what he says. Why would the structure of Western civilization collapse is that if an African-American walk from here to there? My proposal is that he posits himself as a knowing subject. And if an African or a woman or a Latin American or a gay or a lesbian, anything that is outside the parameters of the knowing subject as constituted by Kant, Become, assumes the position of a knowing subject. That is where the post-Kantian or post-Hegelian, uh, this word post is abused, uh, begins to, uh, to uh, take shape. Now, as you all know, none of these questions we are asking today are entirely new. Philosophy has always questioned itself and philosophers have wondered what it is they're doing. What has changed is the world in which we are asking these questions. And precisely for that reason, we need to come to terms with the world where we live and have a sustained course of critical thinking about the world we inhabit. It is not surprising that as a post-colonial subject, a creature of the condition of coloniality, determined to interrogate its power and hold over the matter and manner of our thinking, I have been relentlessly at work wondering where in the world we are, not what, but where, and what constitutes our subjectivity. I just finished a, a project in which I end up with the position of, uh, of uh, nomadic subjectivity. The dialectic as a result between my knowing and my not unknowing subject is precisely where uh, this location is, uh, uh, is located. I also talked to Andrew about the link or the dialectic between Eurocentricism and Europhobia. Europhobia, I've always believed, is the worst kind of Eurocentricism. It's like a bad divorce. You see the former spouse and you start agitating uh, in all directions. What uh, is, is philosophy exclusively European or can there be non-European philosophy too? The question is already loaded by virtue of the non placed in front of Europe. For there is that negation that the world must posit itself as a negational and not as an affirmation of something else. Or the affirmation of something else must be predicated on the negation of something else. I am a non-European. You are a European, I'm a non-European. The problem with the binary that Mudimbe in that uh, video, in that conversation, and also in the introduction to his invention of Africa, uh, is the fact that uh, we, we, in when we come to philosophy is the term falsafa in Arabic is a close cognate of philosophy and without even going to hikma, which is another uh, word that we use in Islamic, uh, in Islamic uh, uh, philosophy and has a different set of connotations. Now that brings me to a subject again that was of interest to, uh, to Andrew, namely uh, my work on hermeneutics of misunderstanding. And as you all know, and it goes back to, you know, Gadamer and uh, Umberto Eco, all understanding is misunderstanding and no understanding is misunderstanding. And in fact, there is a wonderful film of Abbas Yorostami, certified copy, I don't know if you have seen it. And again, there is a video in which he talks about that film and in which he says, love is a misunderstanding. Love begins and continues with misunderstanding. People don't understand each other and they fall in love. And the minute he says it with a, with a sharp sense of 
twisted uh, pleasure. The minute there is understanding between two people, love ceases to exist. Love continues until there is a terra incognita. We don't know where we are. We're trying to figure it out. As soon as we figure it out, finish. There is, there is, uh, uh, there is no more love. Uh, that uh, also connects to the process of canonization. That again, in my recent work, I have been thinking when and how did it happen that Plato uh, became more canonical than Xenophon? In what context? When was it? Why is it that Xenophon's Cyropedia, which both in its own time and in subsequent generations was, and he was a contemporary of Plato and they were both students of uh, Socrates. Uh, Xenophon's uh, Cyropedia is politically uh, far more important than Plato's Republic. Uh, not, not in a sort of a uh, abstract uh, 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 comparison, but in terms of its presence in European and non-European historical co uh, context. Uh, this does not mean that contrary or perhaps not in contrary, but perhaps in uh, a conversation with Habermas, the necessity of talking about how canonization of texts happens in a public sphere, in a bourgeois public sphere. We have to begin 18th and 19th century formation of pu bourgeois public sphere public education, public sphere, public intellectuals, all of those factors in which canonization uh, takes place. But that public sphere, ipso facto, already is a global phenomenon. If we go back and read the structure of, uh, the, uh, structural transformation of the bourgeois public sphere, we are in the presence of, uh, of a transnational public sphere. Uh, 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 in, in, in a recent book the, uh, on uh, Persophilia, I talk about the rise of Persophilia in 18th and 19th century European bourgeois culture in which both biblical and classical antiquity take on Persian culture are resuscitated and then attention, what Said kind of formulates, theorizes and dismisses as Orientalism if we go at it, not through Foucault, but through Habermas, there's a whole different contextualizations, namely the manner in which canonization of both European and in this case, Persian, it could be Chinese, it could be any number of other uh, cultural references are uh, canonized. When we, do, when we place the articulation on the location of the bourgeois public sphere, if you don't know, and I'm sure you know this text of uh, Tomoku Masazowa, the invention of world religion, uh, how this, this idea of world religion that she is, uh, the book was published 2005, is still a very valid argument about the idea of world religions, uh, as she puts it, expresses a vague commitment to multiculturalism, I'm quoting her, uh, is not merely a descriptive concept, world religion is actually a particular ethos, a pluralist ideology, a logic of classification. At any rate, I, uh, I draw your attention to it because she goes after the idea of world religion the way in my recent work I have gone after the idea of world literature in order to complicate the idea of world. In my work on... Uh, on uh, in which I take issue with uh, the way we have received since Goethe idea of uh, world literature is introducing three uh, worlds in which an, an epic like the Shahnameh is produced, but you can extend it to any other epic. One is the world in which the epic is created. That's the uh, Ghaznavid context of the uh, 10th and uh, uh, 11th century. That's the world in which the author, the poet, creates the, uh, the epic. Second is the world that the epic creates. The epic creates its own world. In this context, in the context of Shahnameh, this world is divided into three uh, crucial 
seg segments. One is the uh, mythic period, one is the uh, heroic period. And it's uh, uh, very much similar to Vico. One is mythic, one is uh, heroic, and one is historical. So that's the second world, the world that the epic creates. The third world is the world in which we receive the epic. So the world in which it is created, the world it creates, and the world that in which we receive it, which is historical and falls, keeps going. This dialectic among three worlds totally complicates and uh, disrupts the idea of somebody, whether it's uh, Goethe or David Dambrosch or uh, Emily Apter, I mean, uh, or friends and colleagues and extraordinary work on the idea of world literature. That whether they are for world literature as David Dambrosch is or against world literature as Emily Apter is, the thing is there is something called world literature that is with capital W, capital L, whereas the task is to, uh, 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 to complicate that world. Uh, now, the, uh, the, let, me, let me see how is the time doing. Uh, Andrew, how, how am I doing time-wise? You're absolutely fine. I think we have another um, 20 minutes. If okay, you... good. Here, I want to take you for the remaining time that I have the way I'm thinking about a space, because as I said, far more than the ipsaity or the quintessence of what it is uh, world philosophy is, is the location of world philosophy. And the location takes me to the question of a space. Uh, and in my recent work, I have started reconsidering the French Marxist urban sociologies Henri Lefebvre and his idea of the production of a space. This is how Lefebvre proposes the idea of the third space. First is the physical space, second is the mental space, and third is the social space. Example of the first is the fact that I'm now sitting here in my apartment, you're sitting in your apartment or office, that's the physical space. Mental space is that now we're having this conversation in the context of a, a lecture series. Uh, and third is the social space that this pre is predicated on it and, and, and requires. Now, more importantly than even Lefebvre, if we move to Edward Soya. I don't know if his, his work has come across to you, his notion of third space. What he calls a spatial trilectic. Soya's third space is both real and imagined, what he considers spatial justice. Here, in this context, when I was talking about art, the, 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 the space of art, I have proposed the idea of a third space is open-ended, miasmatic, and we must think of it as a cumulative or evolving trilectic. While Soya points to hybridity and the duality becoming trilectical, and thus the third space opens up, I propose an interstitial space, which I borrow from, uh, from uh, architecture, interstitial space, which is hidden to both the first and the second spaces. Lefebvre and Soya seem to me too Christian in their preference for trilogies and trinities for the world at large, especially if they might be more inclined towards a Manichaean Hegelian dialectic. On this trinity, we become all not just Christians, but far more importantly, implicated in a post-national trilectic, where art, which is the subject of this particular uh, reflection, loses its power of subversion about which uh, I'm interested. I opt to sustain the subversive power of art, or you may say philosophy or literature or poetry, in and of itself undeterred, for it is precisely in the subversive power of art on that interstitial space, which is not a museum, is not an art exhibition. Uh, it is on the internet, but it is not just on the internet, where this interstitial space of a post-colonial and post-national state loses all its relevance. Now, 
as I said, I borrowed the concept of interstitial space from art and architecture. Contemporary art historians have already noted the fact that there are many forms of art that defy the accepted boundaries of genres and media. Here, work of art is of art or fiction becomes its own interest space internally, as I said, the space that the work of art creates, then uh, succumbing to establish boundaries. The idea has its resonances in architecture, where an interstitial space is where a building is made more pliable or multiple and varied uses. The way I use interstitial space is to think of it as a location for the urban guerrilla art fair. I just made it up. Where we perform a revolutionary confiscation of the work of art from the bourgeois public spaces, and in which context I've called it parapublic space because it's hidden from the uh, public camera, in which it is a staged and without uh, depositing it, depositing it into any other bank or museum or biennale, we cash it in for our own revolutionary subversive transgressive purposes before I put it uh, provocatively Christie's and other auctioneers uh, uh, take it over. Now, uh, to conclude, let me say the following. To talk about philosophy today requires two radical axle differentials, location and gender. And here by gender, uh, I'm, I'm totally on the same page with Judith Butler, namely non-binary. What is word philosophy is now a moot and outdated question in my humble opinion. Philosophy has left Europe as a, meta as a metaphor, but has not landed anywhere else. For from cyberspace to outer space, we have come to frame the fragility of a planet that can no longer sustain itself, let alone its European hangups. We begin with Adorno. To write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric, okay? And continue with Arendt's essay, magnificent essay on refugees, and come to Agamben's theorization of camp. And from there, I take my readers to the leaking boat, one leaking boat, off the Mediterranean Sea carrying homeless refugees. That is where the philosophy starts today. Or with a mother whose child has just been abducted by US custom officials on the US-Mexican border. That is where philosophy starts, where philosophy is located. And certainty of epistemological foregrounding, suspension of the uh, uh, weight of history, defiance of binaries of European and non-European, and fresh start for critical thinking, whether we call it philosophy or dance, is for the next generation to decide. Thank you for your patience. Um, thank you so much, Professor um, Tabashi, for a lecture that I felt had um, breadth, depth, and poignancy all together in one, which is a difficult thing to do, so thank you. Um, we're going to move to questions now. Um, I'll ask one to get things going, but before we do, I just want to quickly remind everyone, um, you're welcome to um, post questions in the chat, only if you don't want to ask them verbally, but please do use the raised hand function, and you can start doing that now, and we'll go through the queuing system. Um, I just want to ask you, um, by way of getting things started, um, I, I was really um, gripped by your reminder of the contrast between a knowing subject versus a knowable world. And, and then you, you hinted at the transnational public space, which um, you is where you posited where we need to rethink location. And so I just wanted to actually ask you, does this dichotomy of a knowing subject and knowable world still stand in a transnational public space? What does that look like today? We're no longer in the age of Kant, but what does that look like today? Well, excellent point. Uh, when I was positing knowing subject and knowable world, I was reading, giving you my reading of the three, uh, of the three uh, 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 Kantian critiques. 
but the point that you're raising is absolutely correct. Namely, we are integral to an evolving public and what I call parapublic spaces. Parapublic is a concept that became useful to me when I was doing uh, my work on, the, uh, on Persephilia, namely when you have refractions of European ideas that go into Asia, Africa, Latin America and find camouflage presences or subversive presences, and I call it parapublic. It, it goes into prisons, it comes into internet, you know, it has uh, the, the, the public space, the public sphere has become amorphous. In that amorphous disposition of the public sphere, you're absolutely uh, correct. Namely, this binary between the knowing subject and the knowable world collapses. Not only this binary, but the consciousness of the knowing subject, I mean, this is since Freud and Lacan, is in, con is in contestation with the unknowing subject. Uh, of within the knowing subject that makes things more uh, complicated. So what we have is a condition in which uh, from the epistemological foregrounding of who and what is a knowing subject in what particular way, race, gender, class, all of those uh, uh, factors to what is the, the space in which we are doing our philosophizing, our critical thinking. Uh, I mean, again, look at the very uh, prospect of Zoom Without the Zoom, I couldn't be here and having a, a you know, a simulacrum of a conversation with my colleagues, uh, as you know, re required by physically my being at SOAS in in Europe. So these are all realities. So by going to a leaking boat in the Mediterranean or a border between U.S. and Mexico. I am trying to anchor my understanding of the knowing subject, unknowing subject, knowable world, etc., in a location that will enable me to think, but at the same time sort of holds my reason and sanity together in order not to succumb to a condition of amorphous and knowing that is the end of philosophy. Thank you very much. Um, I believe Stephen had the next question. You're muted, Stephen. Do you mind unmuting and starting again? We'll try to unmute you here. Apologize, yeah. I uh, apologize. I'd forgotten about that, yes. Um firstly, um uh, firstly, where would you say Schopenhauer is? Because of his deep interest in in non-European thought, and in fact uh, it's part, uh, probably departed from Kant. And also when you say about the leaking boat in the Mediterranean or the border with Mexico, uh, is that where philosophy, well, perhaps is where, or is it where we th think philosophy should be, but where politics is at the moment rather than philosophy, maybe? I'm, uh, I'm just asking you both. Yeah. In, uh, regarding Schopenhauer and any number of other uh, takes on Kant, uh, their interest in non-European uh, is not just Schopenhauer, it just goes across the board. They've always been interested in non, uh, starting with Plato was interested in non-Greek non philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the appropriation of Greek for the quote unquote European philosophy is itself as a trajectory that I developed in a recent chapter on, in a conversation with the Rudolf Gachet. Uh, so, you know, it is part of the conversation, but uh, my issue with that is none, the, the, the preposition none put in front of anything, non-European, none. Uh, okay, yeah. You, you know, uh, you don't want to be, you want to be known as a Stephen O'Kane, not as non Hamid Dabashi. Yeah. I'm, I mean, uh, you know, uh, when I had just come here, we had a friend, his name was Javad, and uh, our professor said, what is your name? So my name is Javad. He said, do, do you mind if I call you John? Uh, who said, no, you can call me John, I wouldn't answer. Uh, so it's the question of nonity, non-entity that is generates a, a thing. Now, you're absolutely correct that right now, a leaking boat uh, border with uh, US Mexico is a political proposition, but it is a political subject. It has been uh, a political subject, but I deliberately, because I, at the beginning of the talk, I suggested 
location is the issue, where is the issue, not the what. The what follows the where after we decide what the where is. It is the vulnerability, vulnerability of the, of the, of the globe, vulnerability of the planet, environmental vulnerability. The fact that there are 850 million human beings, according to UN, go to bed hungry every night, that there are 320 million uh, people roaming around the globe uh, in search of job. This is long before the, the pandemic has started and showed how you know, entirely interdependent we are. Going for the most vulnerable, where the most vulnerable is, is where philosophy has to start. Otherwise, we become all accommodated by you know, the location, whatever location, whether it's a university or a, or a college or a, any other institution, is to plant the camera of observation into the, in the most vulnerable in order to, for philosophy once again to become relevant uh, and ask uh, a philosophical question from political positions. You're absolutely correct. Thank you for that. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Mathedon and then Dr. Hawthorne. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Davashi, for an eloquent delivery. Um, and, uh, well, it's, it's sort of related to um, the problematizing of uh, the non uh, that, that you just talked about. And I was thinking about how you also talk about how problematic the whole idea about uh, using world, it be world literature, world philosophies, uh, world religions. Um, my, my question is, um, how do we, because if I want to do philosophy, I want to do philosophy. I don't really like to always show clearly that I'm talking about African philosophy or Eastern philosophy. But within the politics of knowledge and the politics of higher education in general, and how it's been so deeply entrenched into system, what philosophy is thought to be in many universities as a Western experience rather than a human experience. How then do I, for instance, within source, show that what I'm doing is different if I then just say philosophy at source and not say what philosophy is at source, just to give it a, a, a sense of difference from what is usually obtainable. Um, yeah, so uh, any ideas of how on how this issue of terminology with regards to what philosophies might be dealt with? Excellent, excellent. Uh, I always put it provocatively, Elvis, to my, my students. I tell them only in New York you have Mexican food. In Mexico, people don't have Mexican food. They just have food. Only in New York or London you have Chinese food. In China, people don't have Chinese food. They just have food. So this ethnicization of universes is something that happens here. The second, coming back to your point about the institution, when I just got joined Columbia uh, 30 years ago, uh, we have something called core curriculum. And I went to teach core curriculum. I entered the office of uh, Eileen Gluli, my dear friend and colleague now. And as soon as she saw me entering her office, she said, we're teaching the Quran. I said, good for you, but what has to do with me? I'm not going to teach the Quran. Quran is a wonderful book, but I want to teach core curriculum. At the time, again, non-European uh, ideas and thoughts were under the rubric of major cultures, major cultures. So I told them, you mean minor cultures. Now they call them global core. And I tell them, you mean local core. So there are all of these euphemisms that are, that are used. But on the positive side, the fact is that today, you and Andrew and uh, the rest of your uh, colleagues, Professor Hawthorne are in one space. And we're being paid a salary. I mean, plumbers make more than we do, but you know, we, we, pay, we pay our bills. And we're tasked with the noble task of philosophy, asking serious questions of where we are, what, we, what the hell we are doing from whatever location. So the question of whether what I'm doing is philosophy or not philosophy is entirely irrelevant. 
I don't have any hang up on that thing. Or no, yes, I'm doing philosophy. No, I'm not doing philosophy. This is a, 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 the reason I wanted to share that video with, uh, with Hannah Arendt, that she philosophizes about not doing being a philosopher. So that is not the question. The question, again, if you look at the rest of Mudimba's conversation, but more importantly, Mudimba's own uh, the invention of Africa, is raising quintessential issues, existential issues, ontological issues, and not having hangups the way that Heidegger had in that famous exchange with the Japanese interlocutor that I hear aesthetics, I hear uh, Greek. Okay, hear Greek, so what? Uh, I hear Greek, I hear Arabic. Why is it that you don't hear Arabic? Uh, the, 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 that is the, the selective, I, I call it choo-choo train uh, uh, theory of history. The, the, the train starts in, in Parthenon and comes all the way to Brandenburg uh, Gate. That, that's the, uh, the is a, is a uh, pizza pie theory of uh, history. You dropped Plato in the pond, it goes all over the place. It's not just coming this uh, direction. So what we call it, world religions, world philosophies, histories, you know, uh, you start that very definition and constant institutionalization is the location for you to start philosophizing. Uh, the, the subject of your matter, for example, the question of uh, white skin, black race that you raise, it's a universal, I took the question of black skin, white mask of, of, of Fanon and turned it into brown skin, white mask because the insight that Fanon was addressing some 70, 80 years ago, was it still relevant in a different codification of color? The, re the relation of power was important, not the color codification. Sometimes we take the color codification for the real thing. The real thing is the relation of power. Gender codification, color codification, racial codification, these are manifestations of the actual relations of power. Um, thank you very much. I believe it's Sean next. Thank you. This is such a nourishing and interesting and um, provocative conversation. Um, and it, it, I really just kind of want to pick up on what you just said. And this is this question of power with regard to this prefix world. Not all worlds signify in the same way. And I'm thinking particularly of the way in which uh, the concept of world religions emerges as you mentioned uh, Masuzawa's work, um, well, it's a very different logic to the way in which uh, world philosophies gets framed, right? They're addressing two distinctive problems. On the one hand, with world religions, you effectively have a kind of colonial attempt to create species of Christianity and then to impose them on uh, various populations, right? So the assumption is uh, the logic there is one of sameness, but it's obviously a, a very specious sameness. With world philosophies, what you're confronting is the total colonial denial um, of uh, the capacity of other cultures to have sophisticated or not sophisticated, but nonetheless, philosophical systems such that the work that the term world is doing there is to say uh, no to that other colonial dynamic, no to this imposition of sameness, a recognition of, of that difference. And I'd just be really interested to hear um, whether you think that's the case or whether there's still a kind of colonial logic smuggled in by that attempt to challenge that logic of differentiation, which is always a logic of, um, of denigration. The very conversation that today we're having, this very exchange between you and me across the pond about what does the world mean when we say world philosophies? Uh, what do you mean? What is it doing there? Because when, uh, uh, when uh, Goethe was using world Weltliteratur, he meant something other than German. So I reverse it and say, excuse me, is German also Weltliteratur or is only Persian and Kaswahili and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Bengali that is world literature? If they are world literature, then German is also world literature too. So this constitution of this binary, I mean, this is the issue that to this day, David Dambrosch is trying to, is a struggling with and is trying to uh, salvage the idea of world religion. Uh, 
but with, with world philosophies, I see the significance of when you put it in plural, because th then you're also changing the idea of world, because now you're, you're rethinking the world, you're reworlding the world. This is what in my work, I have paid close attention to a number of important thinkers, both European and other uh, thinkers who are thinking about world. One of them is this extraordinary Spaniard, a Spanish his, uh, historian, Americano Castro, who wrote a book called Spaniards and their, and their, uh, and their History in which he says deliberately that I am going to decouple Spain from myth of Europe, I'm, I'm quoting him almost verbatim, and reconnect the Iberian Peninsula to its North African context. He was a linguist. He ran away from Franco in the 50s and came to Princeton and wrote this magnificent book that I strongly recommend. So he, what he does he, by, by decoupling Spain from the myth of Europe, and constituting a world linguistically, he was primarily a linguist, around uh, the Iberian Peninsula that goes all the way to Southern uh, France, com comes into the Iberian Peninsula, goes into North Africa, creates a whole different world. That's the one example. Ferdinand Brudel, in his, the his work on the Mediterranean, abandons the idea of land as a as a defining category of civilization and goes to sea. To me, it's, an, it's a liberating moment when Mediterranean Sea, which means uh, you know, Spain, Turkey, uh, North Africa, Southern Europe, they all become part of a unique phenomenon. Something that Titus Burkhardt, when he was writing on the rise, uh, the rise of Renaissance, he had to violate in order to push the rise of Renaissance to Northern European context, Abandoning is, is Mediterranean context, whereas the rise of Renaissance makes far more sense within its Mediterranean context. So that's a second example. Historically, Ibn Khaldun, in, when he is theorizing, there is a geography to his historiography. When we read uh, Al Muqaddama, you see him also operating in a different geographical imagination. But my utmost, my, my most favorite example is Al-Biruni when he goes to India and he writes his famous book, Tahrir Mal al-Hindi, the book on India. Early in the book, he says, this is 11th century, B Biruni has gone with the Ghaznavids to India and is writing a book on Indians. He says, you may wonder, what am I doing to write about India? And my answer would be, I'm writing about India because we don't know anything about India. We so much don't know anything about India that when we want to scare our children, we show them a picture of an Indian. Now follow this. To come to think of it, Indians don't know anything about us Muslims either. When they want to scare their children, they show them a picture of a Muslim. Now, what does he do? They say he's a, found, he's a founding figure of anthropology. God forbid him from his admirers. He's anything but an anthropology. He, is, uh, he has, his mind is very epistemological. He abandons the binary. We Muslims do it this way, these Indians do it that way. He introduces a tertiary factor, which is the Greeks. This is what Heidegger will, will and Levinas, they don't know what to do with. It. He introduces the Greeks, creates a triumvirate. The Greeks do it this way, the Indians do it this way, and the Muslim do it, does it that way. Completely abandons creation of any binary. That is a world that he creates in the 11th century by virtue of this seminal text. So when you put, I mean, example can abound. You can go to Jose Marti when he wrote his magnificent essay, Our America. He creates another America as opposed to the North American America. It, when you put these various articulations of that constitution of worlds, uh, Jose Marti, uh, uh, Americano Castro, et cetera, et cetera, you see that the theoretical postulation of world is an ongoing organic proposition that in my work, I have tried to retrieve for us to re-articulate what world is it that now you and me and Stephen and Andrew, what world? And this world has its exigencies and contingencies. This world is fragile. This world is coming to an end. This world is, is environmentally in danger. This world is 
uh, population wise, in terms of any number of urgent material, the fact that right, you and I have to stare at each other through this mechanism of Zoom because we're afraid we may catch a, 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 a virus, uh, uh, et cetera. A new variant has appeared and, and Boris Johnson is in trouble. Uh, that world, that world is a reality, but that world requires theorization. And that theorization is a philosophical proposition. So I'm not wedded to anything, east, west, north, south, where is my pillow? The, one of the issues that I have with, with the Santos is this idea of the epistemologies of the south. The epistemologies of the south are, are, can be as flawed as the epistemologies of the north. There was a bit of north in the south and there's something of a so south in the north. The, the, we are run out of those options. We don't have those options anymore. So, Philosophizing the location of the world, what world is it where we are right now? That's, the, that's where the wisdom starts. That's, that's super, really appreciate that answer, thank you. Um, thank you so much, I believe Jared and then Sohan. Thank you, Dr. Fami. This has been a really magnificent um, talk and it's, it's, I've got so many notes in so many different directions, but something that struck me and I wanted to ask about um, um, you, your discussion of, of art and using art objects as a way of, of, of contextualizing this is, is really beautiful. And something that struck me was, I come from an arts background, I studied performance and, and this dialogue is very interesting in that sense because performance today, and, and I think many forms of, of modern art, the audience inherits the artwork. And this goes against the kind of classical narrative because it removes the authorship or what the composer might have intended or what the author intends. It, it takes on the meaning within the world of the audience, within the mind, and that can be individual or can be um, group. Um, so when we're taking that away, um, when we're taking that authorship away, how does that not then, you know, become an act of appropriation? Because what tends to follow on that, that that inheritance of the artwork is then an imitation or a simulation. Um, I'm studying yoga at the moment and we look at the, how these traditions are inherited or pulled by other contexts and they take on a new identity. So maybe I could, if I could humbly ask if you could speak a few words on that, please. Absolutely. Uh, that's a very, very important question, namely, created a dynamic in terms of how uh, the author of a work of art, a painter, a painter, a composer, uh, uh, an artist, a performer, uh, uh, has a certain degree of authorial autonomy until and unless a work of art becomes part and parcel of a public domain. The best example right now, as I said to some of the colleagues, I'm getting ready to teach a course on Epic and Empire using the example of uh, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, is the uh, last episode, ep episode eight, or was it six of the last season became hugely controversial because people didn't like that ending. Now, my position was there was no way on planet earth that these two poor showrunners would have ended this show to any, everybody's satisfaction. Because by then, the audience had become the omniscient narrator. Even when they were surprised, they thought they had willed it. You know, it's a pick -a boo game when the children play pick -a boo with their parents because they are in control of disappearing the, the parent and then reappearing the parent. So the authorial voice and the authorial intention Intensio Octoris, uh, as, uh, as uh, Umberto Eco uh, calls it, does not disappear, is the machinery that generates the, the whole production. But the more public the domain of reception, the more out of control uh, that dialectic or trilectic uh, emerges. 
To me, at this stage, I cannot go to an artist and say you no longer matter. Of course, she, he is the author. Of course, that, that, that matters. And But one has to equally be conscious of the fact that the text has its own intention, intensio lectoris, uh, Umberto Eco called it. The, te the text, namely, right now, this very these very words that come out of my, my mouth, I have an intention. I'm not, hopefully, not yet an insane person. But I'm not in control of the text itself, especially three days from now when the recording is watched by a colleague, a friend, a, a student, how that text resonates as a reality unto itself. But that person itself, the, the student, the colleague who sits down and, uh, and, and listens to this conversation, that also has an intention. These three intentionalities, the dialectic that they create, the dynamic that they create, to me is far more compelling uh, and allows for the intention of the author to remain relevant, but at the same time be cognizant of the larger frame of references. Um, thank you very much for that. I believe we have um, Sohan next. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I, I have a question, and I'm thinking about this idea of, of the leaky boat in the Mediterranean and how that boat is probably hypermobile because of the movement of the sea. And so I'm wondering if when we ask the question of where is world philosophy or world philosophies, we're not receiving as an answer a non-location. And I'm wondering if, if that's the case, then is it even possible for that non-location to exist within the confines of a location? And so can we as philosophers exist in that non-location, even though you know, we're here in London or in New York, where you know, it's considered the center as well, centers of philosophical thought? Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent point. Uh, this notion of mobility, Remember that, uh, you know, uh, we were just talking with Nietzsche, this is Andrew's uh, book, uh, Truth is a, is a Mobile Army of Metaphors, right? A mobile army of metaphors. So the mobility of that leaking boat or the immobility, we may see it, it may sink, destabilizes any assumption of center and periphery, okay? that New York is not the center, is, uh, this, the, the phrase in that part of the world, you know how the journalists say that, you know, uh, so, such and such happened and in that part of the world, that part of the world is this part of the world. And this part of the world is that part of the world. Namely, you, you decenter, decentering, which means by starting by decentering, going back to the, to the uh, issue that uh, Andrew raised, namely our knowing subject is decentered and is mobile. And is uh, Bradiotti's work, wonderful work on, on a nomadic subject, is so crucial that nomadic subject is no longer just nomads, uh, is the fact of homelessness, is the uncanny disposition, let me put it this, this uh, uncanny disposition of the knowing subject. That even if we are located in New York, in London, there is an element of uncanniness about our location that makes uh, certainly suspect, but I'm not a nihilist. I'm not uh, saying, oh, the, you know, oh, let's all shake hand, go home, and uh, let's get ready for the doomsday. No, this very conversation, the fact that Andrew wrote to me, Hamid, would you come and talk to us? Yes, Andrew, with pleasure. Then an, ad, then a, then a, then an announcement go, go, goes, uh, goes around, and now there are 29 people sitting and joining our conversation. That act itself is an occasion for the uncanny and unknowing subject to be in the company of other un, uh, uncanny. And, and then that takes us to Bakhtin, to, the, to this polyphony that is generated. But within the polyphony, then there is a possibility of a of a collective knowing subject, of a public reason. I mean, it goes back all the way to, to Kant's uh, what is Aufklärung, what is, uh, uh, what is uh, enlightenment. We're public reason, okay? We have generated a new public. Within that public, a new public reason uh, emerges. And that public reason cannot be entirely, you know, uh, divorced from the realities in which, uh, the realities which constitute our publicness. Very good point. Can I quickly ask you to follow up on that actually? Because I think um, 
maybe this is me trying to wrap my head around it, but you've just talked about the knowing subject is decentered and mobile, kind of the, the metaphor of the nomad, the homelessness. And then you've talked about public reason, you know, the, the reality of that publicness being constituted. And I, so I'm kind of wondering your claim about the knowing subject being decentered, is that a cognitive claim about human thought in general? Is it a sociological claim? I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around what appears at first glance to be contradictory points you've raised. It is a, it's an epistemological proposition uh, of a knowing and knowing subject to be in a position of the uncanny, unheimlich. Uh, the, uh, going to the German original is, is more effective, unheimlich, uh, uncanny. But at the same time, is not wayward, it is not futile, it is not, uh, it is not ad absurdum. It is located again, going back to Sohan's excellent point, it is located, however, uh, and locatable it might be, it is located. Right now we are located, despite the fact that it took this span of, I don't know, an hour, an hour, 15 minutes of conversation for all of us to be on the same page, but we are more or less on the same page. We are having a conversation and that conversation is taking place within a space. Yes, there are many foregroundings to that conversation. We come from either identical or similar intellectual, moral, imaginative uh, frames of references. But at the same time, we are parts of different world. And yet this is space created the subject at the conclusion of which we can each write an email to a friend, to a colleague. We just had a conversation about the title of which was, and we talked about X, Y, and Z. So that space, that proposition constitutes the knowing subject as an epistemological proposition without being wedded. We are not married to any you know, epistemology, Europe, non-Europe, South, East, South, North. We are wed the only commitment is the, the dignity of conversation, taking the conversation seriously, getting up in the morning, taking our shower, despite the fact that we don't, or we are not in each other's physical presence, making sure we smell good, ma making sure that our background is kind of decent and presentable, and beginning to put coherent sentences, hopefully <laughs> coherent sentences together. That, to me, is the beginning of wisdom. Anything else that follows after that without asking you that you, Andrew, you have to convert to my philosophy, convert to my religion, convert to my geography. None of that. All of that is free. Oh, the only thing that matters is decency of intelligent and honest conversation. You follow? Then whatever follows, it is also... Uh, uh, it's contingent, it is not definitive. Okay, is it is a Rorty? I borrowed that from Rorty's uh, Richard Rorty's notion, notion of contingency for the time being until further notice within this particular space. I, as a knowing subject, you as a knowing subject, this gathering in a particular configuration of its sentiments and understandings, we come to the following understanding conclusion at least we speak the same language. And this language has nothing to do with the English, Persian, Arabic, or, or Chinese, because you can, as Rumi says in that magnificent poem, there are, there, there are Indians who don't understand each other's language, but there are Indians and, and Chinese who understand each other perfectly well. So it's a different uh, a language, a language that is mutually cultivated. That's all there is. There's no mystery. Mutually uh, cultivated until further notice. Um, thank you very much for that reply. Um, I just want to open it up to the, to the floor again for any any last questions. Um, like you've given us so many things to, to think about and many things for me to think about. But is there any last questions? Perhaps people want to type if they don't feel comfortable um, asking, or any other hands that want to go up. Ten twenty one. We have entertained each other for an hour and a half, Andrew. Not bad. <laughs> I see. So, Han, is that a last question? Another question? Yeah, it's just um, a little comment. Something that um, in, I thought about when uh, Professor Debashi was answering your question, Andrew. Um, I was thinking about this idea of others and how we're here and we're plural peoples, and yet we're talking about a similar thing, and we know each other enough 
to understand that we will understand one another. And it made me think of uh, this notion of the difference between black and white and gray and gray in Kearney's text, um, Strangers, Monsters and Gods. And I was wondering if there was anything more we could say maybe about that plurality whilst also having a sense of commonality. I don't know about Andrew, to me, uh, uh, you can bring into the conversation a black or a white or a gray, uh, but what the particularity of that position of either of those colors or any number of other colors might be is a matter of historical or genealogical or biographical uh, her, uh, memory. But once it enters the public domain, it creates what Durkheim called conscience collective. You know, it's hovering over, over that. That's, that's uh, the collective consciousness that is not reducible to anything particular that I said or you said or Professor Hawthorne said, but all of us said and has generated this cloud, rich and enriching and fulfilling cloud that can start raining after we have all adjourned and left. That collective consciousness, that public reason, which is not reducible to any particular particular component, is what remains, and what is uh, what is at issue, whether or not we as humans are are still capable of that. I I am uh, I'm not pessimist. I think we are. Thank you, Professor Debashi. Um, do we have time for one more question? Is that okay? Of course. Of course, of course. Um, I've just seen um, Professor Siebers has raised his hand. Just for context, I was joined by Professor Siebers earlier today at the workshop um, that we had on the, as you put it, the very confusing connection between Ernst Bloch and even Sina. So uh, Professor Siebers, go ahead. I believe you're muted actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that was, it was, it was a very interesting workshop. Um, Bloch was one of the first people, I think, who, who had a conception of, of world philosophy, at least in, in that tradition of, of, of German thought. Um, thank you very much for your, for your fascinating lecture. It was wonderful to listen to this. Um, my, so uh, my, my, I, I would like to maybe mention two points. One, one is that um, I, I very much appreciate and like the idea that um, philosophy has gone out of Europe, but it hasn't found a place uh, to, to land yet. And maybe that word philosophy itself is becoming uh, problematic and not what, what the Greeks used to think about, because we all think about these things, but to call it philosophy. And uh, I was wondering how, how you, um, if you think that there is another word that, that, is, that is more suitable for the world as it is developing today, um, what will we call it? or is there a need for a name or not and my second my second question would would be um it seems to me that as long as we keep talking about um understanding each other we need to understand each other or it's good if we understand each other or if we speak the same language or we can speak the same language even if we have different tongues i think we're still tied to some of the conceptions the deep-seated assumptions of greek thought um where we have to uh we can understand each other only if we speak the same language, because otherwise what is in my mind cannot can never be what is in your mind. Um, there is a self and there is another, or there is what is what is me, my identity, and what is foreign. And these kinds of um, deep-seated distinctions seem to me to be given with the ideal philosophy as the Greeks conceived of it. So would it would it not be helpful to to depart from these notions of understanding of a shared language, shared meaning, and find different ways of talking about what it means to be in communication with each other? Absolutely, uh, Dr. Sievers. I but the only, my only concern is to de-Europeanize Greeks. Greeks were Greeks. Plato, Precisely. Greek Plato did not think of himself as the father of European philosophy. Uh, nor did Socrates, nor did Aristotle. I mean, these are truism, it's not the earth shattering uh, thing. Once we do that, we have liberated the Greeks who were very, so I, I, I put it provocatively recently when I reviewed something, I said, uh, if I were at the time of the marathon, 
of course, I will fight on the part of the Greeks. What, what, I, would I leave the, the company of Plato and Aristotle and go Cyrus the Great? What, 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 what I have to say? Cyrus the Great was, uh, at the time when I wrote this, was George W. Bush of his time. What do, what do I have to say to him? Uh, so yes, absolutely. We do need a common language, but we are not parrots. We cultivate, we, we criticize, we reconceptualize, we reappropriate. We re etymologize words, concepts in a fair and, and uh, open ended and uh, uh, democratic leveling uh, ground in which we can have eyeball to eyeball conversations. And a specific example yes, uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle were all lovely people. But when you move into the text of somebody like Sohrawardi in the 11th century, you see the presence of pre-Islamic Iranian philosophical traditions that did, were not, are not evident to, to Plato. You see Islamic, but meaning Quranic concepts enter into his philosophy. You see Indian Vedic ideas entering into his philosophy. This has to do with his location. He, he, he was killed very young. Uh, uh, at the age of 33. I don't know why all of these great people die at the age of 33. Uh, uh, but in the space of his philosophy, which he oscillates writing in Arabic and Persian, there is something is happening that worth knowing without fighting, whether this is all Platonic tradition or no, it's Iranic tradition, no, is with no. I mean, these are in an, at some brilliant point, I forget, I think is in genealogy of morals. Nietzsche says, if they have given you a catalog or the, a genealogy of an idea, they think they have resolved it. That doesn't resolve it. Uh, uh, positing Sohravardi, oh, the Ishraqi philosopher, the illuminationist philosopher, was God's gift to humanity. No, I mean, they're all great philosophers. They're all wonderful thinkers, and it's beautiful to spend time with them. But I don't have to choose. Right now behind me, this is where the, the, the English and the German and the French and the Plato, etc. right in front of me where you don't see is all my Arabic and Persian and Urdu, etc. And I'm not, Professor Siebers, a schizophrenic person. I hope by now I have convinced you I'm capable of, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes of consistent conversation. There's nothing, I mean, we can go to, uh, uh, even a schizo is good to have a little bit of a schizo. In other words, this is the reason, going back to the conversation with, with Sohan, that if we agree on this uh, ground on which we're all equals and we're talking in, a, in honest and, and conversant ways, in a respectful ways, I don't think I'm, I have, uh, 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 you know, I, God has whispered into my ear some sort of a truth that is only a Muslim can understand or an Iranian can understand. You have to be a Muslim. We are all part, and the same is with the idea of Europe. Europe has to be brought into the bosom of the world at large. This is the issue. The critique of Orientalism, the critique of colonialism are at the bottom uh, 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 epistemological critiques, not racial critiques. There yeah. was nothing, there, was, there is nothing fundamentally flawed with uh, Levinas. I mean, in many ways, I'm a Levinasian. I, 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 between uh, totality and infinity and a number of books, I choose the totality and infinity. But the man, you know, had a blind spot. We all have blind spots. So what? Moving on is not, you know, the, the expression, the baby and the bathwater. We don't throw the baby and the bathwater uh, together. We have to see in what particular ways. So in, in response to many of my American friends, colleagues critique, hold, you know, catching me red-handed. Oh, he uses European philosophy. Of course I use it. I'm a product of European philosophy. I'm not, uh, I'm not europhobic. I'm not scared if I touch a European philosopher that, because they are in search of, uh, of exotic, your name is Hamid, so tell us something exotic about uh, your culture. And they get frustrated when I maneuver, maneuver not intentionally, not by virtue of any design. It, this is the way my mind works. And I am, you know, the half decent human being, product of a certain uh, period of time. And I am honest with the way if, if I come across uh, uh, Benjamin, then I cite Benjamin. I don't censor myself that I have to find a Muslim. But if I come across a Muslim, I cite the Muslim. Uh, this is what I mean by taking the location, the space, this very space in which we're talking, 
and we have been talking for an hour, an hour and a half perhaps now, consistently and understanding each other and communicating and asking for explanation. What about that? How do you mean this the other thing? And moving on. That to me is, you know, uh, I call it the day. And I think, I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much for your response. Um, and I think I, you made it very clear now to me that this emphasis on conversation is not, so, you know, there would be a, a facile critique would be to say, yeah, but that is precisely what the Greeks called philosophy, you know, to sit around and talk. And uh, that's what Socrates did. That's, what, that's what, they, what they all did. This culture of conversation is, that is the Greek idea of philosophy, because there you, you go from the self to the other and back again. Um, and you find a common language in which to understand each other. Um, and basically what you, are, what you are saying is, well, I don't want to be hijacked by the fact that the Greeks did that. Um, we can do it too, and we can learn from and each also, other. Yeah, but also the fact that the Greeks did it, this was the point that if I were to walk to Plato and say, uh, Mr. Plato, you know, I'm, I come from Persia, he may not like me, he may consider me an enemy, but he knows where I come from. Yes. So uh, this is what I mean by de-Europeanizing the Greeks. The Greeks are part of a larger frame of reference that have echoes in other contexts. So I have nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, this is what Greeks meant by philosophy. Wonderful. Good for them and good for us that are inheritors of that Greek philosophy. But that doesn't turn me into Eurocentric, doesn't turn me into European. And not that there is anything wrong with the European, is the historicization of how the idea of Europe emerge and in the specific circumstances and is a particularly post-Renaissance, post-Enlightenment proposition of how the idea of Europe as a, as a commodity emerged. This is the critique of Europe as a commodity, not a particular philosopher. And so when I provocatively say, you know, the most significant European philosopher is an Algerian Jew who speaks, uh, speaks French. I mean, this is a biological, fa uh, biographical fact. I'm not making it up. As he says in the magnificent text that I love, and I've taught it for many years, the monolingualism of the Alves, when he claims French. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Debashi. And um, on that note, I think I will um, turn it back over to Elvis and draw things to a close. But just to say one last time, thank you for all the My thoughts pleasure. and questions you've left us with. Um, My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> I echo what Andrew said. Thank you so much. It's been um, a very interesting conversation um, in this last uh, an hour and a half. Uh, just to say, the, the fourth lecture will take place on the last Friday of August. That should be August 27th. And we'll be having, um, I'll just share this on my screen. Yeah, we'll be having Peter K.J. Park, the author of... Um, Africa, Asia, and the history of philosophy, racism in the formation of the philosophical canon. I uh, will be having him speak to us on that day, the last Friday of August. Um, so if you can get a copy of this book and read through before that, um, that could inform a lot of discussions when we have him. He's uh, at the University of uh, Texas in Dallas. Um, yeah, so uh, that being said, uh, uh, this bring up, brings us to an end of this um, third lecture. Uh, I will stop recording now. And uh,